At 6 o'clock, let's commence the Brattleboro Planning Commission meeting of October 3rd. Let's uh, just start with some announcements, if there are any. I know Sue might have one about the public parking signage thing. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, well, two things. The first is uh, you may have received a link to the Vermont radio um, right. show, that, or piece that was done on um, our zoning work, and particularly about, there's a picture about one of our walks, so um, if you haven't had a chance to see that or listen to it, um, look for the link. I sent it to you. Um, they did a pretty decent job, so. Um, and then the other thing is I just wanted to give an update on the downtown um, parking signage that we had brought forward in the spring. And it, it got a little bit waylaid um, with our town manager leaving and um, yeah, just the, the interim town manager being a bit swamped. Um, we did have a meeting last week with Public Works. We're gonna move forward with a lot of the sign recommendations. It's probably gonna happen over the winter. Um, because it's work that doesn't need to be done, um, you know, putting anything into the ground, although there is some adjustment to signs. So they're going to order some new signage with arrows. Um, I think they're intending to do uh, signs on the mast arms um, as well. Oh, so wow. we'll be cleaning up um, mm -hmm. that. We'll be removing the welcome center signage on the wayfinding signs. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so that look, look for that over the winter. They wanted to be able to do it all at once, and that's when they have the person power to do it. Well, that's great. Um, Todd, I'm, I'm sure that that was before your time on the commission. You just joined a couple months ago. But Sarah, is that before? When did you? No, you were here in February, right? So you remember that. That's right. Yeah, no, that was, I I think you brought it up. That's uh -huh. right, yeah. Did you and Gary, like, drive around, take pictures and stuff? Right. Yeah, so yeah. Lena and Todd, if you want me to um, connect that, that document that the, you know the prior planning commission of earlier this year all felt pretty good about and wanted the town yeah. staff to act on <laughs> um, yeah. I'll forward that to you guys so that way you know what we're talking about and um, I guess I'll just say it'd be maybe nice if the um, if the department just you know just says like hey this is what we're gonna do just to keep us in the loop yeah. um, and just as a semi sort of announcement we may have a member of the public here John and he um, John may see that later in our agenda we have a public comment period just smashed in at only five minutes at the end of the meeting um, but the the agenda can be kind of moved around and if you want to comment on something that's an agenda item please do so during that agenda item but if it's about some other topic then um, feel free to take the time right now to do it or at the end of the meeting during that designated time period which we can lengthen to more than five minutes just just give me about a minute because I'm really here to listen. I took the planning walk that was offered by the uh, planning department and uh, it was a great experience and I'm new to Brattleboro and I got very interested in the planning development process and so I'm observing I guess and learning. All right, fantastic. Uh, there will be any other comments besides that? All right, well, we won't hold you to it. Feel free to chime in if you want. Thank you. Same to you, Clara, and anyone else who may join throughout the meeting. Um, let's just uh, go through uh, last meeting's minutes in terms of just if there's any questions or corrections that need to be made, and then, um, but a motion to approve them is certainly in order and acceptable. Welcome is the word I was looking for. Well, we can have a discussion after the motion, too, if there's any edits. So I guess we motion that we approve September 7th, minutes, 2022. All right. Is there a second of that motion? Sarah's hand is up. Great. Any edits, corrections, concerns with the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. That's the two here, and that's the three on Zoom. So that's unanimous. Great. So moving on, we have Brandy Saxton here, um, our hire consultant of the firm PlaySense, who's um, been working on the bylaw modernization grant uh, for us and with us. And um, she will be um, talking about one particular aspect, which is revising the standards for certain zoning districts. Um, so Brandy, take it away. 
Great. Thank you guys for having me first on the agenda tonight. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of an outline. I know we were kind of struggling around what we were going to talk about tonight. Um, but I thought it would be useful to start with a uh, summary slide here and give you some indication of um, sort of the list of things that are potentially uh, up for consideration and that we'll be working on and seeing. And I think that we'll talk, the first one is the idea of the zoning district, uh, uh, creating a new zoning district, um, as Tom just said. And then related to that, um, there's some uh, broader revisions um, and, and changes to dimensional standards uh, in, in other in districts sort of more holistically. Um, and then there were two small issues that we might, I think we'll have time to touch on tonight that are kind of interrelated with the district and dimensional things, which is the multiple principal buildings on a lot and the creation of a back lot without street frontage. Um, and so I'm hoping that we're going to hit on all of those during the time slot tonight. Um, we may have time to just sideswipe the discussion of further district uh, boundary changes um, and sort of set up uh, ourselves for talking about these other items at a uh, future meeting, which will be sort of a, a, these are more larger scale. Um, and, and maybe a little bit deeper policy discussion and decision making that has to happen around those uh, last um, items, which includes the PUDs, some of the district standards, the, the building and frontage type standards um, that you've discussed previously, and the parking um, requirements um, as well. So, <clears throat> with that, I'm going to uh, jump in just tonight and um, what I'm suggesting for planning commission members is to have sort of this framework and to be thinking through the information presented with th these questions in mind. Um, so why is the town regulating residential land uses and residential buildings? Um, what outcome does the town want to achieve? Um, and what do you intend to allow for? And then also thinking, so what else could happen? Uh, are there unintended or undesirable outcomes that um, could could be a result of, of changes or, or maintaining the status quo? Um, so be thinking about this through that lens as we talk about these um, different approaches and different options. And I've kind of laid out some initial um, thoughts that might fits into those categories of, of, of what we would do, what, why, or what the intention is, and then what might also be a result um, as we go, go forward. And I think we'll pause and we'll have some time to discuss that a little bit amongst the, the group as we go. So um, one of the things we're looking at here is the possibility of creating a new residential district. So you have a large residential neighborhood district that encompasses what I would describe as sort of the serviced residential neighborhoods both in and around downtown and all the way up into West Brattleboro. So these are areas that are generally served by water and sewer, um, obviously close to the downtown. Those are um, older historic neighborhoods as you go up into West Brattleboro, you're getting to you know, second half of the 20th century neighborhoods. Um, and you know, there's some, some diversity in that, pretty pretty broad diversity of, of housing types. We saw a little bit of that when we went on the walks. Um, we tried to sort of get that kind of trip through time going a little bit uh, in the areas we could walk to. Um, so you see that the district encompasses quite a range of different um, neighborhood types and building types and, and sort of built form. So the idea would be to, to carve this big district and split it into two, or they could, I guess, theoretically be more, but we're going to start with, with the idea of splitting it into two. Um, and really using sort of the idea of getting the neighborhoods the closest to downtown that are the older sort of pre-car 
neighborhoods. Um, that's obviously not necessarily all pre-car, and we're not necessarily getting all pre-car either, because there's obviously some of that in West Brattleboro as well, and we'll look at that. Um, but getting, you know, the, the, the denser, more compact neighborhoods into a, a new district. And then reduce the lot size, the setbacks, um, increase the lot coverage and the building size uh, to try to encourage uh, more residential units be created in those areas. So what would you get out of this from an outcome perspective? Um, you would increase conformity of existing lots and buildings, although I'll show you some maps in a little bit. That isn't as big as you might think it is. You actually don't have a really large non-conformity issue out there as a range of, you know, thinking that the vast majority, um, or a, a significant majority of, of, of existing um, lots and buildings are actually conforming to your rules. Um, in the zoning. And then, but it would allow some more space for additions and new buildings potentially. Potentially, it could increase the opportunity for subdivision. Obviously, lot size is not the only factor there, it's, it's one. Um, we would have to think about it, look at as we sort of did when we went on the walk. We looked at sort of the lay of the land, uh, where the house is sitting on the existing property in terms of its. You know the ability to cut the parcel or to get access into uh, the rear of a deeper parcel, things like that. So um, certainly, you're opening a door. Um, not everyone's necessarily going to have a property that does, that fits that option, but it, it could open that. So what might happen that you're not really planning or trying to make happen, but is is sort of a, a, a come along effect of, of this. Um, if you had significant take up of this new opportunity to infill into the neighborhoods, you could get um, a, a reduction in yards and in green space tree cover, and that does have down, uh, down <laughs> downstream, I guess, um, quite literally, impacts in terms of stormwater generation and um, even things like you know the urban heat effect as you start to have more hard surfaces, you know more more pavement, more building roofs in a, a setting, and, and less of the green space and tree cover. And then you know there is always the quality of life issue. People who are living in the neighborhood as it's currently configured um, often have that concern, and um, you know there's obviously room for infill housing. Um, without significantly altering neighborhood character, but that is the, the balancing factor that you are um, or, or should be thinking about too is um, those, those quality of life components in individual neighborhoods um, as well. So thoughts, um, before we jump in and, and look at the numbers and the maps and a little more, thoughts from the Planning Commission members around the Outcomes either intended or unintended from this approach. Uh, just a quick question, Brandy. Did, was that included with this packet, Sue? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was it. Thank you. So. <laughs> no. Okay. Good to know. Brandy, I, I remember maybe a couple of years ago, staff brought some something roughly like this idea to our um, to the planning commission's attention, or or as a proposal and. I don't know. Maybe maybe we were confused or didn't get it or didn't support it. I don't know. But we um, we, we didn't end up acting on it. But um, uh, at the time, I I I felt just an expansion of the mixed use district, maybe, which is pretty small, seems pretty compelling to me. Um, but why why propose um, this new one? Because it, it doesn't have quite as many like allowances and, and density allowances as the mixed use does and you feel like there should be one somewhere in the middle between RN and MU? I can address that so, if you want Brandon, oh. too, or you can go first and then I can jump in. If you go first too and then I will chime in. Yeah, so um, we've had issues uh, with setbacks and you know like particularly in, in some of the neighborhoods where the lots are smaller and they want to do a small addition mm -hmm. um, the setbacks are a problem. So uh, our previous zoning did have a different residential district, a couple of ones, and 
in 2015, we tried to you know simplify, kind of standard, simplify it, make mm -hmm. it one district. But after working with it for several years, we just thought this was one approach to take a look at because yeah. um, you know I mean, there's there's quite a few different eras of housing development in there. So you know while the set make setbacks might work really well in Carriage Hill, mm -hmm. they don't in some of the downtown neighborhoods. Right. And um, I would would add into that that the um, the dimensional standards actually don't vary that much between the residential neighborhood and the big use. And so at this point, with the changes you've already made, we're not talking about a density implication at all because there's no density requirement in the district now. Uh, or in any of those districts now. So we're really down to the point that Sue is raising to talk about the um, so the dimensional standards for buildings and lots um, and where those are allowing um, buildings to occur within a lot. And um, the mixed use, of course, comes with, with additional uses, um, but the, under, the actual dimensional components weren't that distinct or weren't that different um, from the residential neighborhood. So I think, Tom, that might be the reason for looking at a, another use, another district instead of just an expansion of the mixed use. But so, so when I doesn't mean to say that there might not be places where you think there should be mixed use where there currently is, but I, I don't think I'm not really hung. Yeah. No, as far as the technical thing of a new district being added versus, you know, one ex expanded, I'm not, it's just, it, it was a point of, you know, I'm not, I'm not beholden to that. But uh, about that term density, I know actually in the, you know, each district standards, there is the term density. And I was using density more loosely because like when lot size is reduced, when setbacks are reduced, when lot coverage is increased and buildings can be larger, that I think is a, a common layman's, you know, definition of the word density. So, so this district, yeah. right, will be more dense, will allow for more, more, more units, more, 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 more building coverage, you know, smaller lots so than the current. I, I'm going to encourage you to, no. to go from layman to professional yeah. <laughs> Thank and, you. Um, and to start to distinguish between density and the bulk yeah. uh, requirements. So the, set, the, the building footprint, uh, the lot coverage, the height, and the setback, those are all dealing with building bulk, yeah. whereas the density standard was really dealing with the intensity of the use, number of units, um, that type of thing. So they are slightly different and from a sort of zoning authority point of view, they are significantly different in, uh, sure. in terms of, of, of terminology. But um, yes, uh, from a, a practical standpoint, um, you know, you obviously eliminated the density numbers in what, like 2018 or so. It's been a crazy few years, but you know, so far it doesn't show that that, that was necessarily something that opened a floodgate to housing. Um, so it leads to the question of whether that was the the, the component that was was keeping um, some of these uh, potential infill projects from occurring, and whether it it might be more these building and, and bulk requirements than the actual number of units per acre number that used to be there. Mm -hmm. okay. I saw Sarah's hand up earlier, I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, I also, I wanted to make a, a comment about the quality of life. I think, Brandy, you spoke about it as like a negative impact on quality of life, but I would challenge us to also consider the positive impacts on quality of life. Um, people who need housing. <laughs> I think would assume, I would assume it would improve their quality of life to know that there are now more could be more units, um, and I just I don't like going down the NIMBY um, path too far because I think there's it's two sides of, a, of the same coin. And I I do take that um, as as something that we do need to be sensitive to. Um, and we don't want to to necessarily support people who want to freeze <laughs> their neighborhood in, in right. absolutely forever as it actually is. Um, but there is an element to think through um, around you know things.
things like how much green space is in the neighborhood. I think sure. it's, it's quite evident that that um, you know, has impacts on how people perceive the neighborhood, what kind of a place they feel it is, you know, and different people are, you know, who, who are, who have, the, who can have a choice, may have preferences. Right. Um, and so you may have neighborhood residents who have strong preferences right. um, and who will, who will um, express them. They may have, have, have chosen a neighborhood for a particular reason and, and if it sort of runs up against um, that changing, and I think it's really a scale of change question. Um, if you were to, you know, take one of these blocks and, you know, redevelop the whole thing at a, at a total new density, that would obviously be a big change. It's sort of like where along this incremental change do you kind of shift from this being, you know, one type of neighborhood setting to being a different type of neighborhood setting. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Anything else from Planning Commission folks? Commissioners, so. feel free to just speak up because, like, with a slideshow running, we can't necessarily see the, all the participants at once. So, if that's okay, tell. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and public, um, yes. raise your hand, please, or or speak up as well because you're lost in the scroll sidebar as well. Some of you. Yeah. And since I'm giving the slideshow, I have even less visibility of all of you, so it's really great if you speak. <laughs> um, so in terms of thinking, well, how far could you reduce? Um, so what um, I put together was, I think, what you could reasonably go to at the smallest end. Um, so I feel like I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> I would I would take that up in the book <laughs> Okay. So thinking um so you've got uh, you're at six thousand square foot minimum lot size now. You know, how far down could you take that? There's certainly as we went around on the walks, we found parcels, some that were smaller. And like uh, we're going to see on the maps, there are certainly some neighborhoods where smaller lots, they were obviously laid out with smaller lots all along and are predominantly smaller than 6,000 square feet. So um, I, I landed down at 3,600 square feet, and I'll show you how I arrived at that number on the next um, slide uh, with a minimum frontage of 36 feet. Because I'm making the lot smaller, Increasing the lot coverage will probably be necessary. Those kind of have to be in relation to one another. Um, one of the things to think about is that a a house with some ability to park at least one car on the property along with it um, sort of has a known square footage that you know we there's a range obviously, but there's there's kind of a a, a threshold that that that's the normal range. And um, we kind of know how much that is. So in relation to the, the overall lot size, um, we, can, we can understand what that, that coverage ratio needs to be. So with regard to the setbacks or the yards, um, this would bring um, those numbers uh, closer to the streets, basically bring the buildings closer to the street, which in those older neighborhoods, um, Many of the buildings will be perhaps a little bit less than 15 feet, although you do certainly have, have older neighborhoods that do have that kind of depth. And, I mean, I think one of the things you run into in Brattleboro is that people are accommodating terrain. So we certainly walked on a number of streets where there were houses at a different elevation than the street, and those tend to be further set back. If it's all nice and flat, it's easier to keep the building right close up to the street if you have to accommodate. So, from change in grade, um, you might end up pushing back a bit further. So bringing that from 15 and 40, so a minimum and a maximum, to 10 and 30. And then reducing the side setbacks from 10 to 6 feet and eliminating the combined uh, com component of the setbacks. Um, that was one thing that um, Sue and Brian brought up, I think, in the, the prior um, 
work that you've seen, that that is one of the elements. There certainly are lots of places in the neighborhood where those numbers work, but there are some places where that combined um, one in particular is problematic. So uh, eliminating that and, and reducing the rear setback as well so you can push back into the rear of the lot. Um, bringing those repairing setbacks down too, recommend that these are the more developed areas um, that are probably already at or <laughs> beyond these setbacks in the first instance. Um, eliminating the non-residential uh, floor area, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few other slides uh, down, but um, that, that component could go away without, I think, a substantive real change uh, that people would perceive in the neighborhood. Um, increasing the building footprint, so if you get some potentially more multi-unit housing into this area with a larger footprint building, um, getting rid of the frontage buildup, that um, component um, here in the residential neighborhood may not be contributing as much as it is in the more commercial and mixed use neighborhoods. And the height and stay. So, how did I come up to 3,636 feet? Um, so, this little diagram helps explain that. So, this is drawn. Um, scale, so it's 36 feet wide, the six foot setbacks on either side, that gives you 12 feet, so that gives you a 24 foot wide building um, that, that could be fit on a lot of that width. Now, what you should be perceiving from this picture is that that doesn't give you the width to get a vehicle uh, to the side and rear of that building. Um, now, when we went on the walk and we looked at, at um, various neighborhoods. We found several examples of, sort of places where there was shared access between lots. Um, and that's really what you would end up needing, either a rear access or a shared access to make something that narrow work. Um, it's not going to work from a sort of front loading off the street, um, you know, individual driveway for each um, house perspective. Um, <clears throat> But you do have neighborhood, you do have some places we found some spots where you have through lots that do have frontage, uh, both at the front and the rear. Uh, or we found lots of examples of, of shared um, access where you know maybe one driveway might serve a couple entrance could serve a couple of narrow lot spaces. So that's and that you know a hundred foot deep with a ten foot front setback that gives enough room to get to get in there, to get a building, get um, parking to the rear, or potentially a, an outbuilding or a garage type structure to the rear as well. So 36 by 100, 3600 square feet. Brandy, do you know um, how many lots are non conforming right now to 6,000? Yeah, we're going to actually hit that with the map. Uh, the interesting uh, thing is that when I said your nonconformity rates are low, I've, I've done a whole series of these block analyses um, for, for other uh, municipalities. So I did both one for Rutland City and for St. Albans fairly recently. And in both cases, they had large uh, swaths of neighborhoods where nonconformity was well over 20%. Um, you've got a couple, like literally three, maybe, blocks <laughs> that are clearly um, built at an entirely different set of dimensional standards than the zoning. But in most of the neighborhoods, probably because of the complexity of the terrain, uh, as much as anything, um, the lot sizes uh, are tending to be uh, larger. And then, you know, that. So you're like, 10 10 percent non-conformity <laughs> it's it's not particularly high well, and i'll show you that uh, visually that's interesting we did a similar um study for bellows falls and they had like 46 percent yes yeah i kind of assumed it would be the same but um but it probably would have been but prior to the zoning change that was done back 2015. Um, in 2015 ish, 
um, when, you know, because the old standards were more sperm um, in some ways. And so I mean, that's probably what you're seeing in Bellows Falls. They probably had a, a standard 10,000 square foot suburban. I think it was District 7, 7,000, which is bigger than Forest Center. So, but yeah, it's yeah. pretty astonishing. Yeah, huge chunks of Rutland City and Gold State, Alden City were so for 10,000 square foot, which is sort of your standard suburban building, so a quarter acre lots. Um, and so you could tell that basically they had been built before 1960, but they could be not conforming um, to that standard. So. Uh, I'm going to throw the map up here, and I think this is going to require me to switch my screen sharing around. Do you need me to? No, I just need to switch which thing it's directing itself oh. to. It might take me a second here, though. You can put a link in the map, in, in the, in the, um, to the map, in the, Presentation, but it doesn't zoom just doesn't automatically go there. <laughs> Not very helpful. Okay. So you should now be able to see a map up on the screen uh, with hopefully you can make it out uh, variations of yellow. So we are looking at this mid-tone yellow area and the bright yellow area. So um, currently these are all, these two yellows are all in the same zoning district. They're all that residential neighborhood zoning district. So this is the first cut at thinking how to break that into two. And I'm gonna walk you along the line so you get a sense of, of where that's, that's happening here at a little bit of a larger scale. So obviously we're up here at the top where the park it is at the north end of downtown, so coming around Chase Street, Forest Street, and down through, so that's taking in all of Oak Street, Grove Street to the, where it meets up with the, the downtown, um, Williston Street, those are the streets we went on the one walk on, so we're on Forest, we come down to High Street and Western Ave, uh, over to Union, um, basically just around the Green Street School in the park, and then coming down there to Elliott, where we meet up with one of the mixed use uh, districts, and uh, going in and behind that, this is where we went on the second walk around um, SC Street, we had a little tiny bit of the intersection there, near the intersection with Burge, and now we're coming around um, Chestnut, Pleasant, Vines, Cottage, Maple to the hospital. So the neighborhood's wrapping around the hospital. And then we meet up again with the neighborhood center. And then we've got all of the um, lots here to the east between um, Canal Street and South Main Street, coming down to the high school and wrapping around the high school. So that's the general vicinity. The idea being that we pull those parts out to make a separate district. There isn't anything up the West Brattleboro at this point that I cut out, but that's certainly a conversation that could be had. There's, certain, there's very little that's in the residential district that's built um, at that form, there is obviously some older built form in West Brattleboro, but most of that's in the village um, center zoning district. Oh, I'm just to start to. Brandy, I have a question. Yeah, move it very carefully before the world starts to turn. Okay, yes. Um, I forget if you said, is this new proposed residential district? Um, uh, did you decide on its location um, primarily to um, align with the existing patterns, or is there any sort of um, aspirational and goals and you know direction with, um, you know, because uh, I did look mm -hmm. at where the um, non-conforming lots were um, as a 
to where there were lots that were smaller than 6,000 square feet as a rough guide. And most of those are captured, not all of them, because um, there are some smatterings of small lots and some of the other blocks from time to time as well. Um, but I think, for instance, um, down here, we saw this when we walked um, this walk along Chestnut in line. There is actually a physical change and a bit, and you can almost see where mm -hmm. there starts to be something of a transition between um, the lots that were built and developed primarily pre-automobile and those that came after. And it's not a completely you know, solid line. There's some give and take back and forth, obviously, but um, you can definitely see just sort of here at the end. I think we came down and we walked, which one of these did we walk where? We walked by. I think we walked by where, you know, you have sort of these first few lots where the houses are quite focused and oriented to the street. And then as you get to the other end of the street, that, that has definitely changed. And those are our later, um, later houses that were, were built in there. And so you start to pick bits of that up. There's a couple of spots, you know, like that. But, you know, could you go, you know, and this is not necessarily the final variation. It was my first mm -hmm. cut at it, um, as sort of where to break it. And you could obviously go further along Western Avenue and pick up some of these other blocks, um, potentially, you know, the spruce, laurel, myrtle, the tree street areas. Um, have some smaller lots in them as well. They tend to have, there's, there's some of them here that are fairly deep, so they're not actually very small in square footage, but they're very narrow. So. Yeah, um, something that kind of jumps out at me is the, um, is the, the areas just north and a little northwest, and, and west-northwest of downtown. Um, I know we're not, you're not necessarily proposing this to like advance like smart growth principles maybe, but it seems like it could maybe dovetail with that. And those areas, you know, in, at least in this draft map are staying, are, you know, our current RN, um, but, so, you know, but, but they're very close to, you know, services and retail and, and everything else. Mm -hmm. when, where are you? Well, I'm just saying about? like, just like there's part of the old RN just, you know, touching um, the urban center and then are you talking about like like um whatever this Tyler Tyler, Tyler. Myrtle okay. yeah I mean I know what the Northeast. houses look like there and I know what the lots currently look like um, but if it it seems like a possible opportunity for for you know making a more walkable and denser mm -hmm. community um, because they're right adjacent to the everything in the urban center but then even so you know just on the west side of um. What, is that Chestnut Street? Yeah, yeah, that the yeah, street right. where the cursor is. The, In the, here, Upper Forest. Yeah, I mean Chestnut Hill. You know, some people can make the walk, some can't. But like w with a neighborhood development area that we have, um, you know, I, I would like to maybe use this this um, this change of, of a new residential district to kind of buttress that and allow for more allow for more housing in where it's, you know, convenient for people, for walkers, and, yeah. So, I don't know, so if you want, if, if my perception is accurate or if you want to speak to it, my sense is that there's some fairly significant physical constraints for the land as we get up to the Chestnut Hill area. Yeah, there there is some ledge up there. We allegedly. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. allegedly, allegedly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that is that that is a constraint, um, but yeah, my sense is if there are parcels that big still remaining that close to downtown, there's probably a physical um, reason that you might want to look into. But that's certainly you know we can certainly look at at that from the point of view of how far you want to stretch that if you want to take the approach of of splitting that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So th this is just a, a point of curiosity for me. If, if there is some constraint like ledge or whatnot, don't we kind of have other checks in the process that, mm -hmm. that then even if like dividing a lot into two or three 
is allowed by the district standards, there's <coughs> other checks that would not allow that to happen if it's not feasible, right? We have some slope regulations. Yeah. Um, we have, which, although I would say, you know, some of it is a little bit challenging in the existing RN district because obviously it's, um, you know, developed around, like, for example, Sporties. If you looked at that property on Canal Street, there's some real challenges giving our slope regulations to be able to redevelop that with mm -hmm. housing. So, you know, that might be something we need to look at in these more developed parts of town. Um, but there are some other checks. I think the ledge issue, though, is is also, yeah. you know, that, I mean, that if, a tough one. We don't really yeah. have anything. On, on one, one hand, there's the environmental protection, right? And then um, allowing an opportunity that could, you know, easily go awry and cause erosion and whatnot. But on the other hand, it's like, well, if someone has the money and the creativity to you know, to build a foundation in a certain way that can handle that sort of unusual terrain, mm -hmm. then why not allow the opportunity for some creative person to do that? Well, I like the house on Central Street. It's on stilts. Yeah, I mean that's. Yeah, I mean I, I know that's not the solution for everyone right. to have you know a very wealthy you know well resourced home, right. but it's it's a solution for some people. I mean, like we were looking at before up by what is it? behind Bird Street when we went up, how the ledge comes off and how there are certain areas like there's always those spots like that and how, what's, what type of challenges would you be facing like you said with erosion? Right. I mean as long as the people can, can meet our environmental protection standards. Right. I don't, I, don't, I don't see just, you know, just saying oh there's ledge in this area so let's keep it um, sparse just because it's hard to build. That's, so I think one of the, the things that the, the zoning map does a couple of things <laughs> um, in terms of implementing your your policies, obviously guiding you know development to the areas where you would prefer it to occur, or you're you're, you're basically sending out signals to the market as to what you want where. Um, I think there's also a benefit in trying to maintain some level of realism. And from both sides, really, um, and in, in the direction of not over-promising mm -hmm. to people who might want to develop the likelihood of their being successful at doing so in areas. So I think if you know that there are um, there are reasons that it's not going to occur, um, you know, signaling that something is, is a lot that high density or high intensity use is allowed somewhere where you know that physically it's really not possible. I don't know who that really benefits. Um, yeah. And then you can also sort of incite people in the other <laughs> direction as well who might be concerned about um, resource protection and who see an area um, that they think has a, a resource value uh, being um, zoned for something. And even if realistically it's unlikely to occur, it can feel like it's threatened to them, and so they can mm -hmm. respond that way. So I, I do like to think about, as we look at those district boundaries, the, the feasibility of, and, and likelihood of what you're envisioning actually being physically possible. I mean, it's never going to be physically possible in every single lot to maximize your zoning <laughs> district potential, but as a as one of the aspects to be considered, I do think that land capability should weigh in there a, a little bit. Mm. Yeah, yeah, tough balance. Um, okay. Okay, so I was going to show you a few other oh. maps. Oh, we have a question from John. Yeah, um, excuse me. Uh, has there been any analysis done of sort of best and worst case number of units that could be added by making these changes and and sort of to the next level of detail specifically are there like a large number of undeveloped lots in this new zoning area that people could come in with these new zoning regulations and you know create more units than they could have in the past or is the expectation that somebody is going to rip down an existing house and rebuild on the property with 
you know, the new regulation to, and therefore create more units than the, the existing house had. Because I, I presume in the latter case, the, a lot of these houses are positioned on the lot that would make it very difficult to, to sort of plausibly add more units. Does that make sense? Yes. So those, are, those are great questions. Yeah, those, those are great questions. And the answer to many of them is no, but um, we'll, we'll come to them when it's done. Well, I just, um, Steve has been doing some work um, looking at infill lots and infill potential, so maybe he can speak to it. Yeah, sure. So I've done a preliminary look at potential, um, I was using the word home sites when I was describing it um, to someone in conversation, but I think it, it basically with the presumption that where would we be able to situate infill um, development in the RN that's larger than the uh, typical allowable ADU of uh, 900 square feet or so. Um, given our current zoning constraints and um, things like floodplain and slope. And it's um, remarkably few places. Um, and I think it, it needs to have that comparison of, um, okay, so if we were to relax the setbacks by this much, how many more of those spaces might there be? Or if we were to consider looking at relaxing our slope standards, um, if, if that was something that we wanted to do, how much more would that give us? Um, there are, I think, a, a decent number of lots where the slope creates a bit of a feasibility issue that might be sort of on the brink if we were to say, uh, maybe it's okay to allow 20% slope to get built on more frequently. Um, that, which isn't you know, necessarily what I'm proposing here, but uh, that might be a make or break kind of thing. But then also, it, it really did seem that the side setbacks in the RN as of right now, um, especially given how many long, narrow lots that we have, um, mm -hmm. that tended to preclude quite a lot of back lots, like uh, kind of like what we're seeing right now, uh, from being able to have a more substantial home site that I think if we were to have, say, um, five to 10 foot setbacks, uh, or maybe come up with a way to make sure that they don't double up on themselves um, the way that they, they seem to suggest now. We might be able to have quite a few more uh, 800 to 1500 square foot type uh, home sites on a lot of back lots. So I've just zoomed in here to Washington Street to, to try to um, give you a visual. I apologize for interrupting. See, that was great information, but I was, I was just not quite clear as to what the answer was. Are you saying we could gain a lot of units, or we couldn't gain many units? So I think that we could set the table to allow the market to potentially provide a decent number of units. Um, I think there, there was a recent study that did not specifically include Wyndham County, but it did get at uh, Bennington County, Cheshire County, New Hampshire, and uh, Windsor County uh, nationwide, um, I think by the American Enterprise Institute that was looking at the gentle touch density um, standards that are similar to some of the things we're talking about here, uh, or some of the things we've already done actually more accurately, uh, considering, you know, if we presume no teardowns, uh, what is the best case scenario for infill given pretty much uh, choices we've already taken in our zoning, uh, and it's remarkably low, the number of units that they expected would be the absolute maximum potential. So I think we're gonna have to be more aggressive if we want to allow for more infill, but ultimately the uh, market failure that we're seeing for other reasons is a significant limiting factor on how much we could actually see. Um, but I don't see that as a reason to preclude the opportunity from coming about if, oh, some, if for okay, some reason. That, so then to summarize, very few units for infill, but if investors came in and did teardowns and rebuilds, then potentially these new zoning regulations could allow for a lot more units. Is that accurate? 
theoretically, I mean, I thank you for asking yes. that question because I, I, I don't want to be suggesting that as a policy, and I don't actually think it's realistic to expect uh, because yeah. we, our our land market just is not giving that incentive, no matter what we do with so the regulations. I'm going to show show a slide to speak to that a little bit, um, in terms of the um, the likelihood of of, of tear down. Um, tear down and replacement is really uncommon in Vermont, in Vermont um, just because there isn't the market demand level to generate um, the profits to, to make it happen. But um, these, so this is a little piece of Washington Street, which I think is a good, um, a good way to sort of talk about that infill challenge. And I think Steve's effort to try to calculate um, infill potential of your current rules and then it would be the same question looking forward if you were going to try to test it against the proposed change to the rule. When we're down to trying to discover whether an individual lot has the ability to have another building put into it and access provided to that building, um, we basically don't have good enough data <laughs> um, to, to make a really accurate assessment. So when we're looking at a picture like this with the parcel lines and the aerial photo underneath, what we're really looking at is plus or minus a couple of feet. And in this instance, a couple of feet matter. So you would really need to go out and do individual sites, um, you know, a sample of, of actual sites and get actual in-field measurements to know um, whether there is um, adequate Setback. If I spun around this map at NASA, we would certainly find at some point a property boundary going through a building. Um, <laughs> what looks like it's going through a building roof. And that's just because it, it's, it's probably unlikely it's possible the building is built over property line. That did happen. But it's, it's probably not that. It's probably just skimming um, the outside of the building. But the mapping resolution just isn't there. And so it becomes really challenging. And we don't have really good mapping of the um, the surface, like the, the driveways and the parking areas. So with slightly better mapping of the building footprints, but it's also not brilliant. So trying to run a test for an entire area like this is really hard. You can sort of do one individual property at a time and, and do some, some spot checks, but sort of get a big picture is hard. So on a street like this, um, and, you know, this is this is a street where there's not uh, severe um, terrain constraints, um, but this is not an atypical pattern. So, um, you know, these are narrow and deep lots. Um, the house is, existing building is, is often sitting a little bit to one side. So there's one side with narrower setbacks and one side with wider setbacks, and the access way is coming into that side of the wider access. In some cases, there's been another building built. Um, it may be a historic building or a carriage house type building. It may be a more contemporary um, garage building. Um, and so you have to start thinking, like, how would you get to this back? Obviously, these two lots here have enough room in the back to put to basically do again what's in the front. But um, you have to get access to them. In some cases, there may be other opportunities. You know, it may be that you could come in from from the other direction. In some places, in some cases, they may be able to put in a shared driveway and, and reconfigure. I mean, there are you are creating a possibility, but in many cases, just because physically, you know, you've got enough acres or square feet to divide by two it's just not configured in a way that's going to make dividing by two while keeping what's already there there realistic and and so that's going to be the case uh pretty broadly um, but it's not you know an absolute zero and there are going to be places where you do find and i have like a really nice one which i meant to like remember so i can go back to um <laughs> which was a quarter a quarter somewhere um, that that had a, a lot that was clearly had a lot of potential. Maybe it was one of these over here, I think, on, on SD. Actually, this is one we walked by. Um, which could be accessed, so this, this lot here could be accessed from three directions. Well, that had a lot of opportunity there. 
So, so that could could get you know in there. Um, these some of these lots on these streets are through. You know, so they they've got frontage on both sides. They have more opportunities. So that's the kind of thing that changing the dimensional standards could influence these types of lots. Um, so we have a uh, Lena has her hand up. Yeah, I'm just curious. I, I will admit um, that I probably should know this by now and don't get. Um, I haven't done enough exploring to really understand the role of alleys here in Brattleboro, but I'm just curious what role, if any, you see alleys playing, because it does seem like that could be a way to provide access to units at the backside. I know in some cities, alleys play a massive role in providing access to what would otherwise be the middle of a block. What yeah, role? and Brattleboro wasn't laid out with very many. <laughs> so there, there's there's hardly any um, of that. There's a few places where there is essentially a a, a fairly service alley type um, access in that several lots share, but it's not a common um, feature out there in the blocks um, around Brattleboro. So, so I think we talked about a very sorry. Hmm? Go ahead. Is there anything to put some in? For it? Yeah. Um, there may be some places where it would be feasible. Um, I haven't really like, gone out hunting for one to see, like, who would you clearly do this, and then that would you know, open all of these up. Um, but certainly, there's, there's opportunity for sharing access. I think, for instance, we saw that on one of the properties, I think we looked at on Grove Street when we were out on the walk, right? That that is what had made building into that property more feasible. Um, was I think, the, I think the woman who owned the property was on the walk and said that basically she had the opportunity to buy the place next door, too, and she did. So then she had control of two of them, and she was able to, to, make, to put in common access and parking to facilitate using both lots to a higher potential. So, you know, those types of opportunities do exist, but um, they may not be widespread. So, um, just in terms of, I'm still sort of working my way also through, through John's um, questions too, but um, let's look at the non-conformity um, piece, so I'm going to change some layers up here on the map. I just wanted to add, Linda, we do allow alleyways in our regulations currently. Um, so I think, you know, hopefully if there's like a new subdivision development, people would consider using right. that. So the little squares that are showing up red, these are lots that are under 6,000 square feet. So these are the non-conformities. And so you will see little clusters. Um, so the um, canal area here, Estabrook, Lawrence, you know, this is obviously laid out with much smaller lots than those predominate um, the, that neighborhood. Um, we come down here, there's a neighborhood by the school, between Hunt and Valley, this block was obviously laid out with lots much smaller. Um, but the more typical thing is, you know, like we see in here, there's a smattering, right, around the hospital we're looking now. You know, each of these blocks have a couple, but it's not a, a large number um, on a block in most cases. And that's, you know, not an atypical um, thing, you know, in some cases we might be looking at a piece that was carved off, um, or it may have been the original plotting um, pattern as well that, that led to some of these little narrow pieces, like something like this one up here at the corner of Oak and Chase actually makes me think that it's possible that this section which is pretty regular, may have been laid out in strips, which wasn't an unusual plotting pattern in the early 1900s. And people bought as many as you know, they, I guess, could afford or wanted. Um, so you, you find uh, variations. There are often variations on 15 so, uh, or 20 
feet, and so people might have bought two or three or even four strips in a row to make their lot when they originally um, developed that land. So you find that in historic neighborhoods, and so you'll every now and then find really skinny ones, um, and then you'll find some sometimes that are significantly larger. <clears throat> so, so that's the nonconformity piece, and then let me just move back out here a little bit. So, let me turn that off here. So right now, under the 6,000 square feet, there's obviously a lot of parcels that could be subdivided. All of these green parcels theoretically have enough land to be subdivided. We're not dealing with the frontage question, which is another one, and then uh, could you actually access this additional land that you carved off, which is another full, full question. But as you can see, that lots that are um, 12,000 square feet or more are are not completely unusual. And then um, if you were to say you went to the 3,600 square foot as a minimum lot size, you would add all of these um, purple lots to that list of things that could be subdivided. And so that, that, would, that trigger point there would be 7,200 square feet you'd have to have before you could contemplate that you would have enough to subdivide. And so that takes in, obviously, a significant portion. So at 7,200, we're capturing a good, a good number of those lots. Uh, Brandy, have you modeled mm -hmm. smaller lot sizes by chance to see what, like, is there essentially a, um, no further return, so to speak, that you could get from, say, 1,500? Um, just as a even smaller number. I, I think if you want to maintain um, side setbacks in a non-attached building form, you're going to need to, to keep uh, to a number that's that's larger than that. In I think that 36, you could maybe go a little from a width is is probably about as narrow as you would want to go with the idea of, like I said, six and six, maybe 24 um, in the middle, that would be buildable. Um, you, I guess you could considerably go to 20, but uh, you're really, you're also starting to restrict the building type a fair, fair amount in terms of what could get built on that lot. Um, so those, the example I showed you, um, the little SketchUp drawing of was a duplex that was 24 by, 32 or something like that. Uh, so they were, you know, that was an up, uh, upstairs, downstairs type duplex um, example. Uh, so that would that would give you a, you know, a really high density overall number, um, but it would still leave you with with a detached building form. I think if you wanted to go to a much more multi-unit and or attached building form, you could get down to, you know, the 2000s or something <laughs> range of lot size, which you know you've done in like the downtown itself. Yeah, I had looked at just, I guess, presumptions based on, you know, if we started at uh, a particular built form and built out, what would the smallest lot size be uh, to uh, mm -hmm. still allow that shape with, um, you know, a given setback pattern. Uh, so yeah, have you looked at the missingmiddle.com website? Because they've got a bunch of building types laid out like that with sort of dimensional standards and setbacks and such, so you can get a sense of, of where those um, those are. Remember they're from California where it doesn't right. yeah. <laughs> um, So uh, one that it seems kind of um, interesting is is working from maybe a 800 square foot floor plate that's 40 feet deep 20 feet wide you know a nice divisible by four so you got your cheap 16 inch framing kind of thing uh and, mm -hmm. and also pretty standard for row houses but not necessarily having to be an attached form um also available as i guess a you could have 
two of those smushed together with the party wall as the um, shared lot line in the middle. Uh, all of those forms, you know, whether you've got just two side setbacks uh, or if you're in, in a row of those only having a front and rear with shared wall, um, you know, those are all able to be under 2,000 square feet, which right now I think I, we have zero exceptions within our current regs to actually get that low, even for. Uh, well, you could through a, a through a PEZ approach. Um, right. You couldn't just through the straight up conventional zoning. And I mean that that form. I agree with you. That kind of attached housing form, or even semi-attached housing form, would be great for new development. Um, but I think you're looking at an instance where it's not going to be an individual infill lot in very many instances in Brattleboro because you don't have that many that are large enough to put, you know, to actually put in a row, you know, even if it's only four or something, right? Um, it is not, that's not a housing type that's just one unit that gets dropped in. It's, 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 it's a more neighborhood um, component. So I think that's the, the idea of, that we'll come back around to with the PV stuff to, to talk about how to do new developments that are sort of more than a one building add into the existing neighborhoods. Yeah, I, I suppose I just wanted to make sure that we uh, push the envelope a bit to see, you know, what's our appetite for considering um, very small lot uh, infill, and I, I guess also maybe thinking of broader policy change that might allow us to uh, not have to bake in the assumption of, of access driveway. Like, you know, obviously the elephant in the room being if, if we would need to get on street parking to be feasible uh, for, for that part. But, you know, I think given our conversation before this um, about how many lots could actually be accessed uh, at the moment with a full driveway to standards, um, maybe that number would be. Uh, quite a bit larger if we were to uh, be able to externalize that car storage space onto the onto the public right away, perhaps with a just on street park. Just to tag on to that a little bit about pushing the envelope with reducing some of the lot sizes. <clears throat> Later in in Brandy's document, um, the uh, mixed use district, which you know I, I keep bringing up mixed use because that's the district I'm in, and I'm pretty familiar with it um, because of living in it. Um, the current um, um, minimum lot size is 6,000 square feet. She's going to be proposing and we'll see 3,600. My lot is about 3,100. And I think there's others. Now, are there drawbacks? Yes, but some, there's some benefits too, which is more people get to live close to downtown. So, so um, I'm, I'm glad that you raised that point, Tom, because I forgot to mention that when I went through um, the discussion of the dimensional standards. So the, the residential neighborhood, the mixed use, and the village center, those are all in the neighborhood center. They were all interrelated in terms of their density and the hot sizes. So if you're going to change the residential and create a higher density or higher density, a smaller lot sized residential neighborhood, then I think um, it would make sense to 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 have those changes flow through those other districts that were similarly situated and are also intended to be equivalent or higher intensity areas mm -hmm. um, than the residential neighborhood. So that's something to think about that um, while we're focused on the residential neighborhood discussion tonight, um, it does actually connect to those other districts um, and what the standards are there as well. Yeah, I agree with that, Brandy, and particularly knowing the history of like, where the mixed use zoning district came from, it was kind of smushing together the residential office and the residential such and such. So mm -hmm. they are definitely, I think, um, should be part of that conversation of dropping. And I mean, maybe that's one of the ways to get at this question that Steve was raising about opportunities for smaller um, lot sizes is to look at those which are sort of that next immediate ring outside of downtown um, as the, you know, and, then, and buffer and transition it, you know, step it down as it goes out. Um, 
So the last one I want to show you gets to one of the other points that John raised about teardowns, which is an interesting. I, this is not exactly to point, but I thought it was, was interesting. It might generate some thought. Um, so the things that are colored orange, this is a very basic cut and would require a little tidying up to go through it because I think there's some things in here that are probably not what I think they are, so it's okay. But if you just take the uh, grandless data and you say, where is the land value that more than the buildings on it, so more than the improvements, so if any of you ever looked at your uh, grandless information or looked at one, um, you'll see that it's a total property value and it's broken out by land and improvements. So where the land is worth more than the improvements, this is generally an indication of areas that are more likely for redevelopment. Um, it's where redevelopment, like tear down and replacement, would make financial sense um, more than when the most valuable thing that you're buying is the building. Uh, you know, if, if you're buying a building that's valued at significantly more than the land, you're tearing down a big component of your, your investment that you just made in that purchase. Whereas when you're buying land that has a building with a lower value on it, you know, that component that you're tearing down is a, is a smaller percentage of your overall property values. So there's uh, some of the commercial properties along Canal Street fall into that category. And in terms of thinking about larger opportunities for um, more redevelopment with, with projects that might produce more housing units at a time, um, this is, these are the types of settings that may be more, more realistic to consider, um, as opposed to sort of within the residential neighborhoods proper. Um, you know, chunks, so this is another chunk of Canal Street as we're coming in closer to downtown. There's a similar um, grouping on Putney Road on the north end. So the, the older commercial structures on Putney Road are in that category of the land being more of greater value than the buildings um, at this point. And then there's a sound note, and I realized that I had grabbed the community pool from the, from the drive neighborhood. I'm pretty sure they don't want to take out their pool, but. Um, there are, you know, a smattering of other lots around, but I thought that those, um, that example, I'm looking along Canal Street and, and along Putney Road, it was just an interesting bit of information there. So I'm going to actually end with the mapping, unless people had something else that they wanted to look at on the map. I know I'm running up against my time slot a little bit. So I'd like to, I had a couple more slides just to hit with the um, last couple of bullet points. Um, so I'm gonna reshare back over the slideshow. Okay, so thinking about the some dimensional standard changes that would maybe be broader than just this residential um, district or might extend to a couple of the other ones. Um, the I think we spoke briefly about the floor area ratio standard um, with the lot coverage and the setback requirements it, it, and the height standard in building footprints and stuff like this. It may be duplicative and it is a more complicated standard to. Um, calculate and, and, and manage over time. So, could, for simplification reasons, you could eliminate that. Um, the frontage build out. Um, so, this information I sent you showed it coming out of the residential district entirely and then in the mixed use, keeping the um, minimum but perhaps eliminating the maximum. Um, with, given that there are setbacks, um, you know, you weren't going to overdo that. Anyway, and uh, that combined side setback piece where that appears. And then a related issue is the one of multiple principal buildings. In some ways, it's, it's a bit of an opportunity to fix some clumsy wording, uh, but allowing 
multiple residential buildings on a lot, you expect them how many units are in the building. So right now it's singles, you can't have more than one. Um, and then there'd be some setback between those buildings. We could do some refining there that might open up a little bit more opportunity in a couple of spots. Um, this one does have some considerations to think about and it mostly requires doing your homework well on the way in when you're permitting the thing. Um, and making sure that you're not creating a problem for the future, which can happen when you end up with multiple uh, buildings on a lot like this. Um, you want to make sure it's clear sort of what the ownership situation is, if they're going to be condoized, if that's done properly, if they're going to share infrastructure, that that's set up properly. And so you aren't just creating um, sort of administrative headaches down the road. It is a little more administratively complicated for the town. You know, there's some administrative simplicity with one lot, one building, one property owner, that when you go and you have sites that are more complicated than that, you know, whether it's dealing with your water, wastewater billing components or it's dealing with tax assessing, it does become more complicated. So you want to make sure things are set up well and you can. And then we talked a little bit about the idea of backlots. It's possible under the current regulations to create them. There's, uh, you know, there's a process to go through and requires going to the DRB. There's um, requirements for um, access. Um, we could probably work on those access requirements to to, to get them um, slimmed down perhaps a bit in the when they're going to be a short. Um, residential connection. I think that language as it's set up now is sort of more rural in nature. Um, you have envisioning that this could be a fairly expensive, lengthy um, access way going across someone else's property to get to a developable lot some distance away from the road. In this case, you know, the distances are all probably very short, so we could probably simplify that and make that a more administrative uh, process um, like I said, we you know we definitely do have a lot of those deep lots. Um, you do need to you know same sort of administrative complexity um, components go along with that. So that's the run through of sort of immediate ideas um, and directions. So based on what um, I've heard tonight, I haven't heard any sort of major change in direction. So the next steps would be to, to draft some language on these things and to start um, working those those actual changes in concept into the changes in language. Commissioners, any um, does that sound good or any any final words for not these changes, they're gonna come before us again and again. But um, any, anything else to add? Todd, yeah. Can we get that, uh, that slideshow or a copy of the data of it all? Is that in our, our site? Can I just look at it there? It's not in the site yet, but okay. I'm sure Brandy can share it and I'll get it. That was well yeah. presented, Brandy. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so I, I, would, I, would, I would make the presentation up to about an hour ago. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge until Wednesday of last week, we were moving in a different direction and she totally oh, yeah. shifted gears because yeah. I was out early last week. So oh. she's really worked hard to pull mm -hmm. this together. Well, it's certainly not something we're, you know, we're voting on this meeting. So I think it was great to have it presented by you instead of us just reading it and coming up with our own sort of maybe false interpretations or anything. So I, I think this was great. I, I can also turn that mapping thing into something you guys can access and, and play around with it too if you want to go in and do that. So it's, oh, cool. it's available here. i zoom around and get a lot of that. Okay, uh, yeah, I saw Todd nodding his head. I'll, I'll look at it too, um, and maybe others. Um, will, will we be seeing you next month, Brandy? I believe so. Okay. Well, great. Um, so thanks again.
Yeah, thank you. Okay. And we'll move on to our next item. Speaking of a thing, uh, not noticing a thing in the drive folder, um, was the um, the energy one put in towards the end? Uh, did you put it in? And which I'm not. And when I say that, I'm not. I, We're going to talk about it. I saw it over at Gary's, and it's a lot of text. And so I'm, what I'm proposing is that we put that one towards the end. Yeah. In case we don't get to things, I, that sounds like a good one not to get to. Yeah, yeah well, okay. because there's not really language for you. There's a discussion oh. to be had about what we Yeah, and it looks like it's a, you know, a lot of, uh, most likely Steve's very good um, in-depth stuff. So it's not something, that's, something that's good to, to ponder on one's own time <laughs> in advance. the first page and a half. <laughs> All right, it's a required reading. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of it is fun. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> sure. well, that's why I want to give it due consideration um, yes. in preparation. So these are just four, if we get to them all, um, of the uh, ideas that were part of the June 6th joint meeting with the DRB and DRC and the Planning Commission. Um, just ideas that mostly those other two boards or committees um, had with proposals or areas they thought were troublesome with our current regs. And uh, these were four that seemed um, pretty uh, understandable and feasible to work on, and so staff has. Yes. And sure. So um, the first one, there was a request for a front setback waiver, and it'll be interesting to see how you know this potential new district might play out. But we still think it's it's useful to have a front setback waiver. And so what we're proposing is um, pretty pretty simple, actually. Um, you could get a waiver for, of the front setback, the minimum front setback, of up to 50% of the district standard. So, you know, if it's a 20 foot setback, you could uh, go to the DRB and get a waiver of up to 10 feet. Um, we also have a maximum front setback, and um, there are situations where, you know. Todd, could you mute yourself? I'm uh, sorry, what was that? Could you mute yourself? Yes, I can. No worries, just paper shuffling. Um, yeah, so the maximum front yard setback. I, I might want to work on this language a little bit more, but basically we wanted to allow a waiver when site conditions um, prohibit lot development in compliance with the, the maximum setback. Um, you know, we've got a lot, that we were talking about that ledgy area where they wanted it to be 40 feet back because they're claiming that there's ledge there. That seems reasonable to me. They could apply for a variance. Um, variances are pretty difficult to get um, in Vermont, and our DRB has been very strict about that, as they should. Um, so, you know, but there are times when maybe there's a wetland or there's some sort of natural feature that might prohibit um, strict compliance. So it just gives them a, a, a nice out. Um, so, so that was the waiver language that, that we're proposing. I've got a thought about that. Um, if we weren't considering, and Brandy didn't put it up on the screen, but it was part of the background material, the change to the mixed-use district, I think currently the front setback for that is 20? 10. Oh, it's 10. Yeah, I think it's 10 all around. Oh, 10, and that's what she was, what was she changing it to, anything? Gosh, I've got it right here. I guess that's okay then, because then fifty percent of that is what the houses commonly are there in my na in along my street and neighborhood, and which seems fine to me. Yeah. And you know, it doesn't seem like it's causing you know cars aren't driving into them, and it doesn't seem like we need sidewalks since on such a low traffic road. So, um, so I like seeing this 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 um, this proposed front um, front setback waiver of allowing fifty percent of ten feet, because that's in line with what's. Seems to be working fine there. Yeah, there was no proposed change to the front setback in the mixed use. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think it you know makes sense to have houses five feet away. At least. Yep. Um. So, so people mentioned. I, I look back at the minutes or the matrix that staff made to summarize the joint meeting, and fence height was also mentioned. And I kind of like that idea of some sort of situational uh, consideration being given for people. Um, you know, if they want to build and we think it's, you know, generally a, an acceptable place for people to build or live, if it's already built, but it seems, 
you know, that'll just greatly improve their quality of life to have a fence. Um, obviously, we have those regs already about no barbed wire and no prison-like fences, right? But um, currently, the front yard fence, if it's in the setback, can only be four feet high, and that doesn't do much for privacy or maybe even traffic noise and aesthetics. So, yeah, I that was not on the list when you and I had spoke to put together the agenda. But actually, late last week, I was like, oh, fences. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not really sure if it fits in the fencing area or in the or waiver, the waiver yeah. or in the accessory. So, I was like, well, I'll get it for the next um, pass. I seem to recall us having a conversation on that in a meeting where it didn't seem like there was much movement on change. Yeah, yeah, I proposed it or at, at, towards the end just as sort of revising the standard, I think, wherever that is. And some people were saying like, oh, has there been complaints or concerns? And I mean, I just know that like in some neighborhoods, I see some front yard fences right along the sidewalk that look pretty darn new. I'm like, hmm, did they just do that and not get permission? But I mean, but then I also think, hey. Good We've also them. made people, the people that oh, did put in a fence that was yeah. six foot, we made them cut it down. Yeah, in some before. cases, yeah. <laughs> we have done that. And then others have been yeah. more challenging yeah. to get into. And yeah, I mean, I'm just speaking for myself. And you know, I understand that the, the, there's multiple people can have any take on, on things they want, but you know, for an open um, aesthetic of community, but also like, you know, can really improve somebody's little, little property. and make it livable. So I don't know. I, I don't know what the wording might be in, in a waiver table for that. But I'm not sure it's going to be in the waiver table. That's where I was kind of yeah, doing right. it over. It might be under the accessory structures table. Right. Or, or maybe it goes in the waiver. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess I'm just, I, I don't know what the solution is. I'm just plugging in. Um, um, and so the other one on that sheet is common scheme premises signs. So these are signs that have, you know, it's maybe one parcel and there's multiple businesses on the parcel. Um, in the neighborhood center zoning district, which is where um, it's, it's um, Canal Street, the exit one area. So sometimes there's a shopping plaza with multiple uses in it. Um, and then that it's also the part of Putney Road that goes from the Veterans Bridge to Royal Plaza. Um, so definitely shopping plaza areas. Um, we were only allowing 12 square feet of signage with no extra allowance if there were multiple uses on it. And that, that was just an error from the writing before. Um, so we think it's reasonable to still keep it at 12 feet. Um, 12 square feet as the free sign, standing sign area, um, but allowing an extra eight square feet per use. So if you've got three businesses, then it would be the 12, 20, 28. Um, you max out at 48 square, or sorry, 36 square feet in that area. Um, and then it would really be, the freestanding sign height there is six foot, so it would really be kind of monument signs, not, not pole signs. Um, keeping it there and just so you know the mixed use area does include or sorry the sign zone includes the urban center the village center the neighborhood center and the mixed use zoning district so all of those are a little bit more walkable which is why we wanted to keep it at 36 um, total square feet so that it doesn't get too big um, where all of a sudden it's more visible to the drivers but by looking at the right place I see 32 square feet I see 36. Yeah. All right. Hmm. No? My sheet says 36. Oh. But <laughs> maybe your vision knows. No, no, I see it right there. <laughs> Interesting. What is yours? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that's because yours is a color. Oh, yeah, it's actually yeah, 32. Anyway. And then, yeah. and then what, yeah, for freestanding yeah. sign height <laughs> being agree. six feet, what? Yeah. So it means it's going to be more like a monument. It's going to kind of be more ground level as opposed to kind of a pole up in the air. Um, and that's what a, a common scheme premises sign might be? Just only a six foot tall sign? It can be, yeah. All right, isn't that more like the signs that are just outside of, you know, um, any of the businesses right on, you know, on, along the sidewalk in, in downtown? I thought a common premises sign was something like outside of a, like the Staples Plaza that has all those. That things. is a common scheme oh, okay. premises sign. That happens to be a pole sign. It, yeah, yeah, that yeah. you know can be up higher off the ground. 
Um, what we're proposing is that it's a little bit more walkable in scale, so it's it's down closer to the ground. We should have pulled something. Oh, for those us. ones. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, I, th yeah. I was thinking the service center was in there. No, that's two. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's zone two, and that is that's twenty foot height. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm caught up. <clears throat> that makes sense. Yeah. Me. And um, late Friday. Uh, Brian pointed out something to me about uh, gas station signages. Gas station signage might need an extra allotment too, so that might be something I bring back for November. Okay. Now, in zone one, where the sign can only be six feet high, and maybe you already said this, but I was just trying to catch up in my mind. How how could you have a? Oh wait, I guess a thirty-six square foot sign that's six foot high would just be six foot wide. It's not as crazy sounding as I thought it might be before I started saying. It. All right, I answered, answered it myself. <laughs> <laughs> what do commissioners think about, about that? Um, Go ahead. Any other things that jump out about the signage or changes? or It's just that one, one proposed change that you, you're thinking. Yeah. Yeah, that's really where we've had the issue is in the mm -hmm. neighborhood center. So all of these will come back to us um, when we do, you know, we prepare for some public hearing. Um, right. We'll make sure that we're all, you know, that at least the majority of us feel good about um, each land use reg change, and um, and then we'll hold a public hearing where we hear comments from the. It's presented to the public, and we hear comments from them, and then we can make our, our that's our last opportunity to make changes, and then it goes to the select board. Um, that's what they said. But about November, I think, is it? Or? Oh, no. Uh, you're asking when public hearings will be? Right. Oh, no, probably in the new year. Oh, okay. It will be we'll after do Brandy's. These, we'll do these with Brandy's. So. Yeah, it'll be largely a housing theme. Yeah. Um, land use rate change, but we're trying to maybe put in some mm -hmm. other ones as well. So that would be probably after March or something. Mm, maybe. Hopefully maybe before March. That. Yeah. Um, and so we have some other proposed uh, ones to address noise. Okay. Yep. So um, I think y'all have the uh, track changes version of this um, in hand. So the major differences between what we've got right now, um, which had been um, criticized quite frequently in, in its uh, when it came up in the DRB, uh, and, and what I've proposed here is language. Um, first, it, it specifies exactly what kind of noise we're talking about um, and what kind of noise we're not talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll see that um, what, what kind of noise we are talking about is in 322A, um, and it specifies that that's incidental to land use. Um, and then 322B has been added to specify what is not incidental to land use, and then uh, cites the regular Brattleboro Code of Ordinances mm -hmm. that regulates noise um, as a, a civil complaint uh, that's not land use related. Um, Brian reminded me that we should run that by um, the town attorney to understand uh, that we're, or, and to ensure that we're properly citing Mm -hmm. I'm referencing other regulatory documents with that, um, so I think that's a uh, point well taken. Uh, 322C um, is specifically removing the subjectiveness that the DRB um, seemed to be struggling with um, by specifically giving an exact situation um, of what needs to be provided to be able to deny um, a application or issue a zoning violation um, with certain standards of evidence that there was nuisance noise um, and then 322d and e give more information specifically on what qualifies as uh, substantial and um, uh, su sufficient evidence um, one thing that was taken out specifically from that is just the specified uh, type of noise measuring equipment that seems to be kind of antiquated. So um, I think there is a minor risk of there being different 
levels of quality from people recording on their phone. Um, I don't know how serious that risk is. Phones are pretty, uh, pretty good at recording the, the, these days. Um, but essentially, if, if we're provided with uh, a clear record of what the decibel levels were and uh, that they are indeed um, measurable above background noise level for that 15 minute interval, um, that gives the opportunity to issue a zoning uh, violation or deny a permit. Um, and so then the final piece is just the, um, the decibel table. Uh, hopefully you can read the first row on the digital copy that you have. Um, it's kind of washed out on ours. Um, but I've just added a few more time blocks to kind of taper down um, from 10 p.m until 2 a.m., um, trying to allow for just a bit more flexibility for nightlife-oriented uses where we might want to see them. Um, <coughs> all of these things are, of course, up for discussion. Um, but that seemed to maybe be able to um, prevent nuisances, but not uh, sort of roll the sidewalks up at 10 p.m. Yeah, we ran across that in several to get an interpretive clarity on what, I mean, pull out a DBA machine to figure out the sound. Uh, that was my concern, I guess, at the time, just trying to figure out noise can, can be not just that, but operations of any type of machinery or light. So, with, isn't there like an ordinance that's already in place currently? There is a noise ordinance for the okay. town. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's what gets referenced here in the right. second um, subsection that's apparently uh, chapter 13, article 5 right. or 4 of our regulations. Oh, okay. So that it just makes it clear that that's not something that is spoken to and regulated by land use regulations, and so not something that needs to be germane um, for the DRB uh, or the administrative officer. So doesn't our current wording um, put the onus on the administrative officer to take the, te the noise measurement? And this now puts it upon the complainant to provide that 15 minute with a certain sort of adequate device to do so? I mean, I think it's good if someone's going to complain to have evidence. That's I ideal. Mean, we've had complaints where they're like, well, it's happening at this time of the night. And they can't get there then. We, we, yeah. we don't have staff on. That's, yeah, that way that's not going to happen. So um, it is one of those things that needs to be reviewed by the town attorney mm -hmm. um, to see you know, if that's something. That Didn't that do. fall under the purview? It could be it? either. Though. It could be the complainant, or it could they could make a complaint, and if right. he can get it. And then I didn't look into it too much, but the... This is a type, the A in quotes, weighted decibel level information. That's like, that, that's a, um, that's a little confusing, but isn't that like, that's a sort of label given to certain devices that the, that, that No, so I, uh, I took that out originally and then I looked more into just trying to understand the science of what decibels right. really are and how to make a reasonable assumption on what is an appropriate level to cut it off at um, and what's noticeable about background, etc. So that A weighting thing, um, it actually turns out that it's quite important. There are a few uh, cities whose codes I read uh, who break out the noise ordinances. Um, off the top of my head, Oklahoma City was the most verbose and mm -hmm. regulatory of any I found mm -hmm. for whatever reason. I think Vegas actually did this too, which is surprising. They broke it into specific bins of different frequencies of sound, and if you violated the like level of decibels for any given specific range of frequency, mm. you could be violated. Mm. Uh, whereas this requires averaging it all out, which is, I think, just what every measurement device does these days. There used to apparently be a B weighting scale, but it is, uh, mm. according to Wikipedia, basically mm. uh, unheard of. So. I think if you were to just download any app from the app store of mm -hmm. your preferred device and just record sound, it would be doing this. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we didn't leave a loophole for somebody to find one specific frequency range mm -hmm. and, uh, and insist okay. that 
there is a way that that could be used, um, I guess, sort of weaponized to harass um, any noise. So, yeah. You know, even if it's imperceptible. Okay. But is that to a point where law, we spoke of law enforcement too, that there is a law that noise night, I don't know if it's enforced, like the cars or whatever at late night after a certain time, to all that. So that could also fall into that. You know, like you said, you don't have that many people that are going to go out there if there's noise for construction or whatever. So while construction we is kind of exempt. I mean, construction yeah. generally has, the town ordinance has times on the construction. Right. So, so we think um, yes. loud cars would not fall under this zoning. No. It's, it's not a land use. Right. Because yeah. I mean, we had, equipment. if someone has a shop or something like that to doing work, late at night that would fall that under would, zoning yeah. that would fall under that yeah. right okay so if you look at the the second uh subsection of 322b it, it actually gives a few specific what general examples of what wouldn't count uh but is regulated under the other civil um, or maybe criminal um yeah, I thought so. Uh, civil ordinance um, that I, I suppose that would be the police jurisdiction. Uh, and then the last sentence here, 322F, is, is the same as it was in the current regs. Um, and that just specifies that construction is not um, applied here. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so uh, traffic noise, intermittent parties or social events, amplified music in a private automobile, or audible outdoor conversations are regulated by blank and not by the section. Oh, so that excludes deliveries late night to a business. Yes. So I've had that situation where they make deliveries and there's noise. I mean, yeah, it's not that's a gray area. <laughs> yeah. So, so just just to clarify, Steve, it, what I was asking about before, this within your research, you, you think that just the common, I mean, who knows how devices and stuff will change in decades, right? But they'll probably get more powerful. But currently, it's very easy for somebody to just get an app and then use their phone for that's 15 minutes, and that would be admissible? That's my presumption okay. that we could try to test that out oh. um, and see if, if that is actually yeah. Cause it, yeah, I mean, that wasn't clear to me how accessible it is. It seemed like, yeah. oh crap, you know, what sort of um, technology would a person have to buy in order, yeah. but it sounds approachable. The other thing is that these decibels are for the average noise level over 15 minutes. What if like for five minutes there's just like 100 decibels, which is really loud, and then the other 10 minutes, it's the thing is off. It's not happening. I mean, that's, 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 that's a big nuisance. I mean, 100 decibels is, is deafening. So <laughs> but the average of that would be 33 and a third decibels over the 15 minutes. I, I would imagine that that's still applicable under the, the civil section, but we could certainly re reduce the number of minutes that we average it for. I mean, um, what if it just happens at any time at all over those? We could, I mean, I don't... Because that's the way our current regs are. and It's not. Um, oh, yeah, it actually, it's average over a certain time period? average is actually from the regs that they currently are. Oh, really? Um, yeah, so yeah. we could oh. add a section to have a, a number like 100 yeah. where any, uh, any amount of, of sound that hits that level is just immediately a nuisance um, because, you know, I think 85 sustained Right. is considered uh, a hearing risk and you need to wear protection if that's like if you're working on a job site that's always yeah. above 85 and apparently it's a logarithmic thing so every yeah. 10 decibels it doubles in, in intensity right. uh, so 100 is what four times higher than 70 which is mm -hmm. like a typical urban scene and mm -hmm. I guess typical traffic noise sound right. is, is about 70. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're hearing right now in the room is apparently about 60. Yeah. Um, so, you know, 100 is definitely not appropriate. And I think if we could f come up with a way to make sure that that's not, I guess, exploitable as a... Right. I, I don't see any way that that would be... Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's totally appropriate to say that it's just like, uh, what's the pers nuisance per se? Uh, when you hit 100 decibels, because that's genuinely a medical harm. Um, so that, that's a good yeah, one. something like that, I think. 
I guess my I guess I'm trying to understand saying an app is more accurate than the real machinery. It's like saying getting a ghost finder on these apps is for entertainment purposes. How would that hold up? Like you were saying, Tom, you know, those things aren't accurate you know, all the time and it goes by most phones and most phones have different algorithms, different ways of picking up noises. So yeah. is that admissible? I mean, that yeah. without having the real thing? It's like having a, a, a lie detector on your phone. I think it's enough to bring somebody, to, to send them a violation notice, make them correct whatever is going on. If they appeal it, you know. Right, so I like that. If they appeal it in. to the DRB, that's one <laughs> right. level. Yeah. If they appear it, appeal it to court, then, you know, we'll get a ruling. But it's it's pretty common. Uh, you know, it's got to be measured some way. And Yeah, I would like to get a professional you know, come in and I'm sure an attorney could pick apart professional uh, equipment. <laughs> and I can tell you the town is not going to pay for somebody. Yeah, like exactly. And your app phone and stuff from Google yeah. or something. I, I did, yeah, to, to directly answer that, I, I took that into account and kind of grappled with that, that there is this trade off between sort of equity. Of, right. Uh, most everybody could probably get a phone or borrow a phone um, and record on a basic free app um, and hopefully the standards are close enough. I think when we're talking about things that are over 70 decibels, it's right. pretty, pretty uh, difficult to sort of um, get it so out of whack that something that was only 40 decibels was reading much higher than that. Uh, and, and this does specify that you got to be outside the property line to record it. It's not like you could encroach on your neighbors yard and you know stick it in their window right um we're not going to be able to determine that and so maybe we should strike that language too but that yeah that's re retaining what's still in there um but there were some communities around the country where uh and now i'm forgetting who but the new england city had uh if you can if the human ear can perceive it it can be considered a nuisance. Oh, exactly. So like, you know, and that's not a universal standard either. All right. I liked how you changed the table. Well, you changed the table I mean, in a couple of ways, but one of them is by making the receiving property by district instead of by what the use is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that makes a lot more sense. If you're, if you're in the urban center, you, you, sh you know, you're in the urban center. <laughs> right. You don't get to live like, like you're on a mountaintop all by yourself. And, and I did want to make sure that we weren't having sort of like a hard cutoff where with, and, and I think the RN could get bumped up, even though I'm sure that that might be more controversial. Um, there are RN parcels that are close enough to downtown that I don't want to create a situation where, you know, all of a sudden it's 10.01 PM and yeah. you can, you know, start recording. Uh, you know, from you know, fifty feet down the street from Stone Church, and try to harass them for that. Right. Yeah. right. So that's, or, or for example, I, I technically live in the RN right now on Putney Road, and I can tell you for a fact it's seventy decibels of traffic noise all through mm -hmm. the night. So, yeah. um, well, we live in a city. <laughs> we're getting up against that time, but is there commissioners on Zoom? Any other thoughts about these? I think we'll skip the energy thing. Um, we will make sure it's in the folder and Roll get it a ready for month. discussion next month. Yep. See you soon, but if anybody yeah. reads it ahead of time and has <laughs> questions for us. I, I swear <laughs> it's fun it's if you guys want to just oh. go straight to the table. That's why I don't want to rush through it. Yeah. So, um, or go late and have us retired. So. Um, if we want to talk briefly about um, potentially um, applying for another municipal planning grant for fiscal year 23, um, we can. Um, if you all will recall, the uh, the bike ped master plan has been one of those. The um, the housing action plan before that was one of those, and the current thing that Brandy was just um, here on behalf of the bylaw modernization grant for housing was one of those. So we've been really rocking those consecutively year after year. Actually, the 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 bylaw modernization. Me, sorry, the bylaw modernization grant was something a little bit different, um, but the other two were MPGs. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of a brainstorm, quickly. What do, what do people think? That people have any ideas, things that they are excited of working on, or 
uh, a little birdie in my ear said, you know, maybe take a break this year, but that's that's also on the table. It could not be. Could be. I think you said anything to you or two if we have something. Uh, sure. But anyway, the, the application deadline is December 1st, so next month would have to be our, our decision, our ultimate decision. So. Sure, I can brainstorm something. Yeah. I, I mean, I could tell you what, what we talked a little bit about, though I am concerned about capacity because we're hoping to be in a position to apply for some of the um, infrastructure job acts grants, um, you know, for some transportation projects and yeah. stuff. So, hmm. so there is that on that. But um, the, would the planning commission be involved with that? You're saying the planning no, department? No, staff. Yes, yeah, staff, staff would be. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that we've thought about and talked about a lot is um, pre-permitted. Um, designs for kind of accessory dwelling units and other missing middle kind of forms so oh, yeah. you know working with architects or mm -hmm. um, you know whomever to come up with some you know ready plans that people could that right. are pre-permitted so that that was one idea that we yeah we bounced that idea around a little bit last year right not yeah. quite as succinct and clear as that mm -hmm. but yeah yeah so that's still in the housing theme which is working on crisis so um, does anybody have a question of what it can be used for? Anything that I can answer? It has to be made by December. I mean, by next month. December 1st. Yes, yeah, due December 1st. So we really will need to make a decision come November meeting okay. because I'd have to take it to the select board for. Mm. I have several ideas I wrote them down already. I'm going to call a few pods. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Um, you can send them around. Yeah. You're sending to us, we'll send them around. Yeah, all, all that we've been doing since I've been a planning commissioner now with three of these is, is plans, right? Um, but one, one thing that the MPG allows for, um, but that I haven't seen done, is it says funds may be used for purchasing development rights, easements, and titles uh, for property um, for housing and conservation purposes identified in the municipal plan. I don't particularly have a thought in mind right now, mm -hmm. but I was kind of intrigued by that as being something pretty different than what we worked on, and it could also right. support the housing, you know, predicament that we're in. Um, you know, twenty-six thousand four hundred doesn't go so far in providing units, <laughs> but um, I don't know. Maybe it could. Maybe it could create an alley. Ten percent match in, in some block somewhere. Land and site control is a big deal. Yeah. Or, um, yeah. Actually, being able to pencil out, so I, I think it's right. a, a great idea. And then one thought I had too, you know, with my my thinking on parking lots recently, um, mm. was like, if some specific focus is put just on parking lots, and trying to find, you know, some expert consultants can 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 come up with some actual financial feasible ways of. Hey, I, I won't even say housing or making it a park, but just any sort of use whatsoever that can be mixed with a parking lot, you know, put over it, put under it, whatever, that is financially feasible, just for the sake of efficiency and more compactness, um, then that would be great to see if somehow, but uh, maybe it's just not really possible and it's very situation-based, but they could be studying the situation of Brattleboro. So just a thought, I don't know how feasible, but... We'll see. We'll see how that one with Harris lots going. So, and, and I mean, I'm happy to volunteer my own staff time to just demonstrate very back of the napkin wise where we could get that going. I yeah. think it's actually far fewer tweaks of the zoning code than, um, or basically, we could make some some little tweaks of our zoning code to make sure that we could build your classic five over one pedestal building mm. over in the uh, service center, and then plop it right down over current parking, Right. have that parking still be there underneath the building. And I, I think yeah. It's, it's... Yeah, that wouldn't even be town-owned parking lots. Like, I, like, my mind is on it. Yeah, it's, it could I be any parking. I think the, the, the two, or the biggest barrier I see to both of those projects is mm. there's not necessarily a strong mm. link to a plan. Um, there is some with, yeah. like, the Whetstone, you know, we could, we could make a link to the Whetstone Charette work mm -hmm. um, of turning... Um, Preston lot into kind of more active park, um, and possibly some. In the, you know, I could try to do it. It's mm -hmm. not clear. I would say the first one, the purchase of housing sites or conservation land. I, I can't really think of. I, I 
I'm, I'm not sure that that would be supported by the select board, and I don't think there's great links. There's maybe something in the housing action plan. Interesting. Not, we don't call out specific lots, and right, and that's how specific it would have to be. Yeah, so, I think the, the yeah. best you could get was 250 Bird Street on conservation. Oh, that's okay. Pretty. So we we wouldn't be able to necessarily use that to try to make uh, a design for the the uh, kettle pond or do feasibility. No, we got no. Okay. No. Yeah. So. But that is town owned, so right. potentially, yeah. potentially on that one. Yeah. Now, did, didn't you do a while back? We land off guys, of Canal Street, yeah. Did you guys have recently a, a thing about Harmony Lot, too? Wasn't that something? I was thinking of converting that to a nice little mm -hmm. gathering spot for people back then? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where that's at. Gotcha. Various people yeah. okay. champion that. But then yeah. <laughs> not everybody's. It's, it's hard to. Yeah. All right, gotcha. And is there anything we can do with, I know it's New Hampshire, but with the bridges and the idea? No. Oh. I mean, I know it's New Hampshire. But, it's New Hampshire. Um, all right, so some thoughts that are feasible or not. But um, maybe we will um, talk about it more formally and make a decision next month. Well, do you guys want to? Or do you want to do another plan, Grant? Got a pulse here. <laughs> Any? See, Sandman's got a lot of people here. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I think it comes down to staff capacity. Right. TBD. Right. All right, well, maybe we'll bounce some ideas around next month just a little bit, and if, you know, if something really compels us, then we'll see, but if it, if it doesn't, then that's fine. Um, so moving on, we have our official formal public comment period. John, just unmute it. No. I'm a muted, so tiny. Okay. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for allowing me to participate. Thank Secondly, you. Um, I had one final question on Brandy's presentation, slide two. Her second bullet was, what are we trying to accomplish with, with this exercise, or Brandy's exercise? So I thought it was a really, really important point. And I'm not sure, and I wanted to do and dig some research, and I'm assuming, of course, whatever the Planning Commission wants to accomplish is aligned with whatever the city wants to accomplish in terms of its planning rules. Do we have some sort of strategic goal document for the city that says we want to be like this, and this is how you know our rules and regulations can help us become that, that I can look at? Yeah, we have a couple of documents. Um, one is our town plan. I will admit it's a little bit dated. Um, it's available on the website, um, uh, probably in a couple of places that you can find links to it. Um, it's it's if you've ever heard of a like a municipal plan or a <coughs> comprehensive plan, a lot of municipalities have them. In Vermont, they're a little bit different, so they cover lots of different subject areas, and they're um, kind of broad. We try to be specific, and that is kind of the foundational document for any land use regulation changes, so, so that's one of them. And then I would say also for the zoning amendments, um, the housing action plan uh, that was completed in 2021, that one is also available um, on the planning department webpage. That's another, another kind of guidance. I mean, that, that's more about the background of our housing need. Um, it doesn't get specific into regulatory changes. Um, and then another interesting one, um, we had been evaluated as part of a state program. Um, they're zoning for great neighborhoods. And so we had some feedback from them on a couple of issues that are also providing some foundation for this work. Great. And that, and that I think is also on the website. Thank you very much. I do want to have the one follow-up question on that. I was thinking, that, and not to try and be funny by this, by saying this, but is there something in English that says, you know, we want to be an art center in Brattleboro, we want to be have everybody that wants to live here be able to afford to live here? Does that make sense, the question I'm asking? It does. Um, I think the town plan, yeah. you know, is, is the closest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Okay. It's, it's probably not as aspirational as it could be, and part of that is because it's used in a regulatory setting where if you were in a different state, it might be much more aspirational than what we have. Okay. 
Sure, sure. I mean, you have legal, you have legal limits to what you can say and do. Thank you very much for, for allowing me to participate once again. Great. Thanks for coming. You're down. always allowed. Please come back. It's your right. You <laughs> <laughs> had a fight. <laughs> All right. Having no other business. That's it. We are adjourned. There you are. Hey. That's it. Get some hot cocoa, guys. Good night, everyone. Good night. We'll see you next Thank week. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> night.